My name is Alan Castell. I'm a cognitive psychologist at UCLA. And today I'd like to tell you three things. I'd like to show you how our mind tries to make sense of the world, but sometimes plays tricks on us and fills in the gaps. I'd also like to discuss how we become selective and need to become selective. And then, despite experiencing more memory challenges as we get older, perhaps paradoxically, we become more selective and better at focusing on what's important. I'd like to show you some interesting demonstrations that illustrate how our mind sometimes plays tricks on us. What I'd like you to do is just to read each phrase in each triangle. Just read it out loud. Go ahead. So most of you read these as Paris in the spring, once in a lifetime, and bird in the hand. But if you slow down and look more closely, each phrase says Paris in the, the spring, once in a, a lifetime, bird in the, the hand. So you made a mistake, but the mistake made sense of these sentences. And so this is our mind playing tricks on us. We fill in the gaps so that we can make sense of our world. Here's another illustration. Just quickly read this to yourself. Say it out loud. So most of you say the cat, but then again, if you look more closely, the second letter is identical in each word. But again, our mind interprets these letters to make sense of what we think they should say. And the same thing happens with memory. Just because we've seen something many times doesn't necessarily mean we'll remember it. So how many of you know the Apple logo? Pretty much everyone in this room. You probably have it right in front of you on your phone. Now I want you to think about the Apple logo and don't look at your phone. Which way is the bite? Is it pointing to the left or is it pointing to the right? How about the stem or the leaf? Is it pointing to the left or pointing to the right? So when I tried to do this, I then drew the Apple logo from memory, and I'll show you what I came up with. <laughs> you can laugh at my mistake, and there's plenty of them here, but this is what I thought the Apple logo kind of looked like. And then I thought, well, maybe my memory's not so good, so I'll ask my daughter, my seven-year-old daughter. She has a very good memory. I asked her, do you know the Apple logo? She says, of course I do. And so this is what she drew, okay? <laughs> now I had the bite on the left, she had the bite on the right. So we had a little contest, who was right? We both had teeth marks. We have this genetic family history of putting teeth marks in the Apple logo. <laughs> now I'll give you a multiple choice test. So this should make it easier, right? No. <laughs> so how many of you can identify the Apple in this lineup? I hear several different letters from the alphabet. When we ask people, UCLA undergraduates, fewer than 50% of people could correctly identify the correct Apple logo. So simply because we've seen something many times doesn't necessarily mean we remember it. But perhaps there's good reason we don't want to burden our memory with this information. We don't need to remember what the Apple logo looks like. How about things that could potentially save our lives? So how many of you know where the nearest fire extinguisher is? Perhaps at your workplace or at your home? <coughs> Maybe you've seen it, it's bright red. I was taking a safety training course in my office building at UCLA. We were in the basement and we were asked the same question. And my colleague and I were kind of puzzled. We knew we'd seen it many times, but we couldn't quite remember exactly where it was. And so this is a picture of my colleague. He went back to his office and decided to look for the fire extinguisher. And this is what he saw when he went back to his office. How many of you see the fire extinguisher? This is what, there, this is where it actually was. <laughs> He'd had this office for over 25 years and just stopped noticing it. So this is the difference between seeing something and noticing it. And sometimes the more experience we have, the worse we are at remembering things like this. And so we followed up on this. We actually went to other people's offices just to see maybe we were just strange and asked them if they knew where the nearest fire extinguisher was. And most people were kind of hesitant or puzzled. And then instead of telling them where it was, we asked them to go and find it. And so they had to get up out of their chair, walk down the hall, and point it out. And oftentimes, they'd miss the one that was right next to their office. And so this failure to find something, this failed retrieval, then informs memory. It reminds us of what we don't know. 
And then we followed up with these same individuals three months later. We went back to their office and asked them where the nearest fire extinguisher was. Everybody knew because they failed the first time and they learned. And this sort of learning becomes incredibly important. Failure can be a very potent and powerful learning event. We often remember our failures, yet we sometimes seek to avoid failure. Often my daughters will ask me to tell them stories at night, and their favorite theme are mistakes I made when I was little. <laughs> they want to hear about my failures, probably because they want to know what we shouldn't do, but they also want to know that sometimes it's okay to make mistakes. We all grow up. And so their favorite story was when I was in The Wizard of Oz. I was in grade four, and I had a very important line in the play. I was Uncle Henry. If you don't remember Uncle Henry, it's because he only had one line in the play. <laughs> so I rehearsed my line again and again, and I really just need to say one line. Listen, everyone, there's a cyclone on the way. Hurry and get into the cellar. I thought it's a very important line. And so on opening night, I burst on the stage, and I said, listen, everyone, there's a cellar on the way. Hurry and get into the cyclone. <laughs> I'd memorized this line. I knew this line. And yet, the one time I had to deliver it, I screwed up. And my daughters love that story. <laughs> of course, my son likes to hear stories more about how I break bones when I fall. So he's interested in other kinds of mistakes. But it shows that children want to learn from mistakes, and they want to know that it's OK to make mistakes. And oftentimes, we experience anxiety when we're going to give a presentation, when we're going to give a, a test. And this anxiety can influence how we perform. We will often perform to expectations. So when I talk about memory and aging, and I talk to people who are over 50, 60, 70, and tell them we're going to give you a memory test, that results in a certain amount of anxiety. And that anxiety can lead to stereotype threat. We perform as we think we should perform. Research has shown that if you take this same memory test and simply call it a wisdom test, and then administer the same test, older adults do better. So just labeling the test in a different manner can empower people to do better. And that's why I think psychology is incredibly important. Now, how many of you on the topic of memory and aging have had trouble remembering names? Anyone? <laughs> you know you know someone's name, or you're trying to introduce them, and then that name just slips from memory. Or you just heard that name, and you can't recall it. And there's good reasons why we actually don't remember names. Maybe 100 years ago, Mr. Barber was actually a barber. But today, names are somewhat arbitrary. And so I'm going to give you some tricks to remember my name. My name is Alan Castell, and it rhymes with pastel. In fact, my grandfather was a painter. He used pastels. So now you can incorporate my name with something you know already, the concept of a painter. Castell, pastel. Or I can tell you, it looks a lot like castle, but you just switch the E and the L. So it's a castle illusion. So now you're doing something with the name to remember it. And this sort of practice actually leads to good memory performance, yet we rarely do it. So when I give people these mnemonics to try and remember my name, they say, that really helped me, Dr. Pastel. <laughs> <laughs> so they're using the mnemonic but sometimes they're forgetting that you have to go one step further, or they're just playing games with me. <laughs> so I think what be becomes important is not just remembering names, but remembering what is the most important. So to test this in our lab at UCLA, we've used a paradigm where I'm going to present words with, to you, one at a time, and each word is paired with a point value. And the point value indicates how important it is to remember the word. And this is much like a situation where we're often overloaded with information, and we need to kind of put our hands up and focus on what's important. We need to be selective. So in this task, I'm going to show you these words, and they go by fairly quickly. You won't be able to remember all of them. But in order to maximize your score, you should focus on the words paired with the highest point value. Are you ready? There's going to be a memory test at the end. <laughs> After all the words are presented, your job is just to recall as many words as you can in order to maximize your score. Are you ready?
Okay, just recall as many words as you can remember. Excellent. Impressive. So I hear a lot of people saying ticket, house, pizza. You might recall snow or guitar. Ticket, house, pizza were the highest value words, the 12, 11, and 10. And this is what we found. This is the probability of recalling the word as a function of the point value. And what we find are that both younger and older adults are sensitive to value. These are younger college-age students and older adults over the age of 60. But what's interesting is there's no age-related difference for the higher value words. In fact, for the highest value words, younger and older adults are doing just as well. So this suggests that even as we get older, we become selective. Even if our memory might not let us remember as much information, we can selectively focus on what's important. Of course, in this task, I told you what was important, words paired with point values. But in the real world, we often do encounter important <laughs> events that we need to remember. In fact, sometimes it can help us survive. <laughs> and this sort of observa observation reminds me of my grandparents. Even in their 80s or 90s, they'd sometimes confuse my name with my brother's name. But they would be able to recall the price of groceries, and specifically, groceries that were on sale. They'd almost brag about how much bananas were, even if they had to drive five miles across town to find them. <laughs> so we decided to test this in the lab, and we presented people with grocery items and their prices. And you can play along. So your job is to remember the grocery item and the price for a later memory test. But we also presented items like this, <laughs> overpriced items. And some of you might have this reaction like, oh, are these Whole Foods prices? <laughs> and then later we tested people. So now recall the price of the cornflakes? Great. Now how about the price of the ice cream? All right, and some of you might recall $17, or that's just too much. <laughs> and what we found is that younger people were better at recalling the prices, the overpriced items, but older people were just as good, if not better, than the younger people at recalling the prices that made sense. All right, the prices that we experience in the real world, which suggests that as we get older, we can use schemas or knowledge to remember new information. Of course, we might not all be interested in the price of bananas or ice cream. Albert Einstein once said, I have no special talents. I am only passionately curious. And I think what becomes most important as we get older is to maintain high levels of curiosity. We examined this in the lab by presenting people with trivia questions. But before we told people the answer to the questions, we asked them how curious they were to learn these questions and answers. So for example, what was the first consumer product to have a barcode? You can think about that for a second. And then on a scale of 1 to 10, tell me how curious you are to learn that answer. Now, some of you might not care at all, and some of you might be very passionately curious. Anyone want to provide a guess? Cigarettes, ketchup. Cere cigarettes, ketchup. Beer, <laughs> alcohol. It was actually Wrigley's chewing gum. Okay, so now we ask people to rate how curious they are to learn the answer. Let's try this one. What was the first nation to give women the right to vote? <laughs> France, Sweden. Now I ask you, how curious are you to learn the answer on a scale of 1 to 10? And you're like, tell me the answer. All right, it was actually New Zealand. Okay. We asked people to rate how curious they are now to learn that. And then what we did is we surprised people. A week later, we called these younger and older adults who saw over 100 trivia questions, and we asked them the same questions. And what we found is that it was only the older adults who remembered the questions that they found most interesting, that they were most curious about, which suggests that as we get older, we might be more judicious about what we try and remember. We don't try and remember everything but we selectively focus on what's important. And so I think aging leads more to a change in focus instead of simply declines in memory. 
And this change in focus can happen at different levels. I've talked a little bit about the memory aspects, but also in terms of emotion. As we get older, we focus on different emotions. And work at Stanford University has looked at this positivity bias. When you're presented with these faces, which one do you look at first? Which one do you spend the longest time looking at? What they've shown is that while younger people will look at the faces on the right, older people will spend more time looking at the happy face. And this can influence memory in terms of what we recall. It can also influence mood. And it may be related to a surprising finding that healthy older adults actually are happier than college-age students, contrary to many people's expectations and stereotypes. So this focus on positivity may actually be adaptive and make us happier as we get older. So at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned how we're often overwhelmed with information. And I think the key to this is being able to provide a good summary. The other day, my daughter was watching a movie. And I missed the first 10 minutes of the movie. And so I asked her, what did I miss? And my daughter has a, a very good memory. And she gives me a report about exactly what I missed. The plot, the character, the music, where the movie is set. It takes her about five minutes. Okay? Compare this to my wife. I'll miss the first 10 or 15 minutes of the movie, and I ask her, what did I miss? And do you know what her response is? No, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> or she'll give me a very quick summary. Because she has this awareness of what I need to know and what I'll learn by watching the rest of the movie. She doesn't need to rely on her memory for what she's seen. She needs to be aware of what I need to know. And I think this is something that might actually get better with age. Being able to communicate important information. And sometimes forgetting the rest or letting people learn about what they need to know. And so I think when we're presented with a lot of information, we don't necessarily need to ignore things. We need to distill it. We need to take what's important and communicate that to the people who are interested. So if someone asks you, how was your day? You don't tell them everything you did the entire day. You communicate what becomes important. If someone asked you, how was that TED talk? I missed it. You wouldn't give them the 18 or 20 minute version. You'd try and give them one or two minute summary. And I think this is something that becomes better with age. That we're better at summarizing and communicating more effectively. So to summarize, as we get older, we might make more memory mistakes. But this can also lead to some form of adaptive selectivity. We know what we know, and we know what we don't need to know. And we can learn that forgetting is not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes it's good to forget information and focus on what is most important. And I think with life experience, we do this more often. And this is what can allow us to get better with age. Thank you very much. <laughs>